Good evening, everyone. I have, this is Ron Freeman from Special Olympics, Maryland. Um, welcome everyone to the um, athletics preseason webinar. Hopefully um, we will get through all the material that we have tonight um, in, within the one hour um, time that, that we have allotted to get everybody back to their to, uh, for their evening. We have up on the screen, I'm not going to say a whole lot about this, is a fundraising project um, um, in sort of uh, running uh, parallel with the NCAA basketball tournament where local nonprofits are matched against other nonprofits for a little fundraising competition. Um, it's a single elimination, one week at a time kind of thing. And we're currently, Special Olympics Maryland got a buy the first week and is now actively um, competing with Center Stage of Baltimore. Um, I'm not sure when that uh, ends, either this evening or tomorrow evening. Um, and he, the leading fundraiser in these competitions um, moves on to the following week. And at the end, the leading fundraiser uh, wins a $10,000 prize. So, look at the slide, um, which you will get a copy of tomorrow, and um, uh, I encourage you and, and all your friends and family to um, to consider donating and, and help us get a $10,000 prize. So moving on from that. Okay, and uh, Ron, actually one other point with that. Uh, I'm sorry, I thought uh, um, worth telling folks, uh, actually just by signing up, uh, there's a $5 set of points that, uh, that gets contributed oh, uh, right. to Special Olympics Maryland. So you can actually um, uh, contribute or help uh, just by signing up. So um, please do consider it. Thank you. And yeah. hi, folks. This and, is Mike uh, Sarnowski. Good to talk to you all. So um, we will move forward. Um, again, I'm Ron Freeman, venue director for athletics, as I have been since, I think, 2012 or 2013. Um, I can't quite remember. Um, if you have a question um, through the course of the webinar this evening, um, you should have a, uh, you can type it into the question box on your webinar control panel and Mike um, will reach to the group or <clears throat> in um, alternative, alternative to that, you can raise your hand. There's a raise your hand button on that control panel as well. We've been through the welcome and introduction. This is the um, agenda that we'll follow generally, generally this evening. We'll go through um, entries and entry process, rule reminders, the qualifiers that we currently have listed at, um, on our calendar, some resources. Um, Mike will talk about some paperwork key forms and the entry and entry entries and entry process, along with deadlines and dates. <clears throat> And we'll finish up with a question and answer um, session at the end if there are any questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, there's no change here. Athletes must compete in a minimum of two qualifying competitions to be eligible for summer games. Um, athletes can enter up to three individual events and up to two relays as long as one of those two relays is the four by two, which will be on Saturday, and either the four by one or the four by four, which are both held on Sunday. For if you have athletes who are doing the pentathlon, um, even though there are five actual events, um, obviously in the pentathlon, in terms of um, our scoring or our, our processing, the pentathlon is considered a single event. Some uh, event combination exclusions, um, no change from previous years. If, if your athlete is doing the standing long jump, may not also enter the long jump or the high jump. Softball and tennis ball are mutually exclusive. Um, you can't enter both of those. If you're doing one or two, one or the other of the softball or tennis ball throw, you may not also enter, enter either the shot put or the mini jazz and a couple of rules applying to our wheelchair athletes as well. <clears throat> Running and walking events, combination exclusion. 
athletes who are running in events or walking in events shorter than 100 meters may not also enter events longer than 100 meters. Athletes in a 100 meter race may also be entered in the 50 as part of a transition zone. We're trying to move our athletes into more challenging um, uh, events, and we'll talk about that with a couple of new slides um, in a few minutes. As far as relays go, they are open to athletes who can run at least, only open to athletes who can run at least 100 meters. Um, so therefore, athletes cannot be in a 25 meter race and also a four by one. Okay. Uh, Ron, uh, Eva has uh, her hand up. Uh, Eva, I'm trying to unmute your phone. <clears throat> Hello, Eva. Let's see. Hold on a sec. I'm getting a odd message here. Well, Ron, can Eva, you? So I understand that. No, 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 no. It's with the uh, the webinar. Ron, can you try unmuting her? I'm getting a thing that. Uh... Did you actually start the broadcast, Ron? I thought I did. Is, are people not hearing? Ooh. Uh, I think that's what the issue is. I think that's why she probably has her hand up. Um, huh. Oh, I never got that before. So I just got a message to say the broadcast is now starting. I thought I did. Um, okay. Yeah, actually, we should back up. Eva, I'm yeah. trying to unmute your phone. Uh, were you raising your hand because you couldn't hear us? I, I, Eva, your line's open. Can you, uh, you want to ask your question? No, my question was why I'm seeing the screens, but I can't hear anything. The message okay. just kept saying um, that it was going to start. Okay. Yeah, that was a user, user error, Eva, and I apologize to everyone on the, um, on the call. Um, we'll go back to the top, and um, just uh, in case you're interested, I I'm going to go back to this slide. Um, Special Olympics Maryland is competing with this bracket. Um, little tournament fundraising thing. I'll read the slide when you get it tomorrow. Um, you can get a contribution to, your, to Special Olympics Maryland just by entering a $5 contribution without any cost to you. So um, we uh, take a look at the website tomorrow uh, when you get the slides and help us get potentially a $10,000 donation at the end of the competition. Um, most of you already know, if you've been through webinars before, if you have a question to ask, um, you either type it into the question box or raise your hand. Um, and I, once again, I apologize for not properly starting the webinar. Okay, uh, entry is an entry process. Athletes must compete in either in uh, two qualifying athletic, competi athletic competitions to be eligible for summer games. Um, these rules are, are the same as, as they've been for the last few years. Um, athletes can enter up to three individual events and up to two relays, um, uh, one of which has to be the four by two and either the four by one or the four by four. Uh, four by one and four by four are offered on Sunday. The four by two is offered on Monday, um, not Monday. Saturday. Um, the pentathlon, uh, even with its five events um, uh, or five uh, competitions that the athletes are, are running, is considered a single individual event. Um, so uh, consider that when you're entering your athletes. Okay. Event combination exclusions. Standing long jump. Um, is mutually exclusive with the running long jump, or actually the long jump and the high jump. Um, softball and tennis ball throw, mutually exclusive. You can't do both of those events, nor if you're doing one or the other of those, you may not also enter the shot put or the mini jab. And a couple of exclusions for our wheelchair athletes as well. You can see those there. Running and walking event um, exclusion. Athletes in events shorter than one than the 100 meters may also not enter running events longer than the 100 meters. Athletes in the 100 meter race may also be entered in the 50 meter race as part of a transition zone into the more challenging um, 
and longer events, and we'll have a couple of slides, um, a couple of new slides, um, a little bit further on to talk about that. Our relays are only open to athletes who can run at least 100 meters. So therefore, an athlete who's doing a 25 is not eligible to run in a four by one uh, relay. Okay, <clears throat> again, these are um, same slide as past two years. These are our big three entry percentages. 50 meter dash, no more than 25% uh, of your delegation of athletes may be entered in this event. Softball, you can see there, 20%. Standing long jump, no more than 25% of your delegation's athletes um, may be entered in this. And again, the purpose is to move our athletes into more challenging and more appropriate events. If you have um, a unique situation um, and you know, for a, whatever the, that reason might be, and you're asking for a, an exemption from this, just um, send me uh, an email and we can chat about and make a decision there. Um, an example of that would be if all of a sudden this year you have you know, a great number of uh, eight or nine year olds just joining the program and um, therefore that might skew your numbers and percentages a little higher towards the um, more fundamental events. Okay, new slide. Um, talking about our fundamental events. Um, uh, fundamental events are, are those that um, we consider sort of entry, more entry level events, 25 meter, uh, 50 meter, and the ball throws, whether a tennis ball throw or, um, or the softball throw. And the concept of even having these are for our um, athletes of lower ability who are unable to compete in the standard events. What we have found is um, there are you know, some occasions, but not highly, um, uh, you know, not a great many, but there, there are oftentimes athletes who are running or throwing an event that does not seem to challenge those athletes, at least by their results. So we've had discussions over the years of, um, of actively um, putting breaks in our uh, entry process to move our athletes along. We've had several discussions and we see a little box there um, and highlighted in green is what I'm going to talk about um, is what we're moving towards this year, not what we're going to do this year. If we had, for the softball throw <clears throat> criteria, if we have athletes who are throwing a softball more than 20 meters, and frankly, if they're throwing the, the softball more than 10 meters, they probably shouldn't be in a softball event. But for this year, um, what we're going to exclude is if your athlete um, is, is throwing a softball more than 20 meters, he really should be either in um, the, uh, the mini jab or potentially even the, the, um, the shot put. But um, if we look at the numbers, and we, we did uh, an examination of last year's um, events, for the softball throw, we had 54 competitors last year um, throwing the softball. We, seven of those threw the, the softball more than 20 meters. And frankly, you know, those athletes can do more. I mean, they're not being appropriately challenged. So for this year, and, also, and, and we'll talk about the 50 meter race criteria, um, we are if um, we're looking at the 10 seconds, if your athlete um, is running at 50 meters and faster than 10 seconds, then he or she does not belong in a 50 meter race. They really should be moving up to a um, to 100 meter race. So what we're going to do at headquarters this year, um, if uh, we will not be accepting uh, entries for uh, criteria that, that exceeds that first box, that first column in green. Um, if you have athletes who are throwing more than 20 meters as qualifying score, we're just not gonna accept that. So, um, and we will probably, um, we certainly reserve the right to change the, that 20 meter, 50 meter, 10 meter for the softball um, into what we consider more appropriate 
levels. Um, but for this year, we're going to be looking at 20 meter for the softball throw, and 50 meter, we're going to be looking at 10 seconds. And the numbers of competitors um, out of the 50 meter race who were uh, who did it last year, out of 44 total competitors, only eight were faster than 10 seconds last year. So um, for the qualifying scores, we're just not going to accept them. Um, in the actual competition for summer games, uh, if you're athletes who earn a score that is better than the criteria, meaning you know they're right there and you've entered them in the in the uh, less challenging event, they may be subject to a disqualification. So um, what we're recommending is that in your qualifying events, um, in your local competitions, you use the same criteria. So it's not um, not foreign to you when um, when you get to the state competition. For any area that wants to see, um, you know, we we've compiled some numbers. Um, I'm not going to go into them tonight for the um, where the athletes were who you know, and which athletes um, beat those scores you know, from last year. So uh, send me an email. We can send you that information. So um, again, um, the idea behind this is to challenge our athletes and to frankly have uh, them be um, uh, running the event or throwing the event that is much more appropriate to their skill level. Okay, there is um, typically at this part of the, the webinar, we, um, we typically say, well, there's no rule changes this year, um, but this year there is a rule change, and it has to do with a um, the exchange zone for relays for the four by four, not the four by four, um, for the four by one and four by two. Um, and I'm going to let Mike explain these a little bit better. And I'm not sure which slide is easier for him to work with. This one, um, and we had a, a breakdown of of the rules from the um, IATF. I think it was IATF, maybe it was USATF website. Um, so you'll you'll be getting both of those. So. Um, Mike is a little bit more familiar with um, and can explain uh, the, the rule change this year a little bit better than I. So I'm going to hand it over to Mike for a couple slides. Okay. Uh, thanks, Ron. Um, so, yeah, this is a rule change, not a Special Olympics rule change, but as Ron indicated, it's a rule change that USATF implemented this year to get their rules consistent with the IAAF, which is the international governing body. But the bottom line is that. Um, the and this is only for as Ron indicated for the four by one and the four by two because those are the only relay events at least that we offer uh, that uh, that have a fly zone. I um, uh, don't want to go too much into the fly zone because it's going away, um, but it actually is going to lead to a much larger exchange zone. So the new rule, uh, Ron, can you show? Let's why don't we look, go to lane eight and with your cursor, can you show the the front and back of the standard fly, uh, the standard exchange zone, which are the two large, uh, typically yeah. yellow triangles. Whoop, nope. One is back. I just, yep. I didn't want to click. Uh, here. Okay. And here. So yeah. So the the exchange zone has for forever and a day been defined by the by those two large triangles pointing in towards each other. The exchange zone now will extend from the um, uh, the large triangle on the far left. Uh, all the way back to the very to the small triangle on the right. Uh, that small triangle um, had previously uh, marked the start of the fly zone. Again, I'm not going to go into what that is. But what it basically means is now the exchange zone is 30 meters long as opposed to 20. Um, and we'll be implementing that. Those of you who don't wish to change how you train your athletes, that's fine. There's no issue with that. I mean, if you do if you do what you've been doing, it's not going to make a bit of difference. However, it is a new rule, and those coaches who wish to take advantage of it in training their athletes or in race strategy, uh, in terms of where they want to place their athletes to start, the baton can be exchanged back in that additional 10 meters uh, that's behind what had been uh, the um, exchange zone before. Um, so the, the, if you want to go to the next slide, just because for some folks that may be, um, it, it basically shows the same thing, but um, can't hurt. Okay, so this kind of spells it out. 
Um, the uh, what, what they're calling the scratch line is the midpoint of the exchange zone, what used to be the midpoint of the exchange zone. Um, and so now uh, you basically, again, got 30 meters instead of uh, 20. I don't know of any track that is changing their markings. So no, do not expect another large triangle to be where the little one is um, because uh, for, for a couple reasons. Uh, the, the largest one being, or the, probably the biggest one being, is high school uh, federation rules have not made the change. Uh, high school federations still have the fly zone, um, so uh, or the, the NFHS in the U.S. Um, but we follow USATF rules. That's our national governing body, and so we're going to follow this here. So um, you know, at, uh, at various meets, if you have any questions, we can... Um, we can help you with that, or if you have a particular question, you can uh, let us know, and we'll see what we can answer. Again, the, the, the for those of you who want to just continue doing what you've been doing, that's fine, but don't be surprised if some other teams have that uh, the baton being exchanged in that 10-meter span that's behind, if you will, uh, what previously was legal, that that's now legal there. Um, still follows, I think Ron's got some slides later in terms of what a legal exchange is, and that all stays the same. It doesn't change a bit. The only change is where that exchange zone starts uh, for the incoming runner or for the runners there. Okay. Uh, okay. So like, again, like I say, those of you who do any kind of strategy in terms of where you have your athletes or your runners placed, um, this gives you a little more flexibility too. So, um, I guess that's it. Unless anybody has any questions. And I don't see any. Okay, okay thanks. Um, again, this is, uh, not again, this slide is for um, those coaches out there who have um, athletes who are participating in uh, athletics who are on Team Maryland. These are the athletes and the counties they are from. Um, it was um, we, uh, your athletes who are doing athletics, these are the, the events that they are entered in for uh, uh, USA Games. They need to be entered in these events at Summer Games, Special Olympics Maryland Summer Games. So um, just a, a, a heads up to those coaches in those areas. Um, I mean, that is a requirement um, moving forward for USA Games. It's probably um, not new to those coaches, but um, maybe new to some of the others. Um, and we just wanted to have that written down so you would have it um, uh, in front of you when you're entering your athletes. Um, some uh, uh, rules reminders about the weights of the shot puts um, in terms of uh, starts 1500 meter and longer will use a waterfall 800 will use a one turn stagger uh, four by four will depend on the number of teams entered in that division <clears throat> again protests um, for athletics may be filed by an athlete or an official representative um, the head coach of that athlete so i'm not sure what other sports um, uh, allow the athlete to file a protest but Athletics is um, is following that. No different than at least the last three years. Um, rules reminders: It would be helpful <clears throat> when you're running your, um, you know, getting your your times and your distances for um, your qualifiers. Remind your officials that all events, and this is the way we do it at state games as well. Field events are recorded to the next lowest centimeter um, due to the fact that the, the shot um, or the, the, the ball or whatever has not reached um, that next level. So therefore, it is rounded down to the next lowest. A um, couple rules and weights about the shot puts and, and which weight is appropriate for which age and which gender. Um, and a couple of rules. Um, about shot put for, for the technique down at the bottom. Mini jab, this is um, especially true for your athletes who may now be doing 
um, well, it's true for all of them, but for, for athletes who in the previous um, games were doing um, softball throws, who now need to move up to a mini jab. The only real difference is a pretty easy transition between um, a ball throw and a mini jab is, um, is the mini jab needs to be over the shoulder. So if your athlete was somehow doing an underarm throw of more than, than 20 meters, then uh, that will no longer be valid, obviously, for the mini jab. Standing long jump must be a two foot takeoff, both feet behind the takeoff line. And the distance is marked, and this is true um, for standing long jump and the long jump itself. The distance is measured from the mark closest to the takeoff line. So if your athlete falls backwards uh, with, and, or reaches back with his hand, his or her hand, um, or, or, or his, whatever. You all know that. Um, vector lines, what we use, what we measure is um, uh, three by two for the softball, for the um, uh, softball and tennis ball throw. Similarly, the mini jab, same, um, uh, looks the same except a little bit bigger mini jab uh, shape is four meters by eight meters. For your long jump, your athletes, if you're entering them in the long jump, they must be able to jump at least one meter um, to enter this event. Um, any jump less than one meter, it's a fault. Um, for uh, long jump and for the high jump, um, you're certainly, you know, either before the competition starts um, or in warm-up time, you can place a marker on the side of the runway to help your athletes, however you practice that. Uh, Ron, actually, before you go on from that, uh, just an observation from uh, having been to some some of the meets last year that uh, counties were hosting or programs were hosting. Uh, with that long jump, uh, folks, you're not doing your athletes any favor or any favors by having the toe board closer than a meter to the edge of the pit. In fact, you're doing them a disservice. Um, I saw that at at least three different programs or three different uh, meets where the uh, the front edge of the toe board, the, the edge of the toe board closest to the pit was less than a meter um, in there. Uh, you're, there. It's giving the athletes um, uh, a false sense of how far they need to jump to make it a legal jump um, and, and also don't be tempted. Don't don't let you know how how you know, hey, the athletes feel like they jumped further. Um, you're, you're really doing them a disservice from a coaching standpoint in the long term, um, whether they go on to the state competition or not. So please don't be tempted to do that. That front edge really needs to be exactly one meter from the edge of the uh, the toe board. And you can mark that with chalk or any of another variety of, uh, of things. But like I said, I just, uh, sorry to interrupt, Ron. I just remember seeing that yeah, at, the, no at many of the events, or not many, at least three of the events. And uh, it's uh, it's just it's not a good practice. Okay, I'm not going to spend um, very much time on this. This is these are standard track colors. I don't know um, uh, how standard our, our, our quote standard track colors are. Um, many um, many are not. So um, you know this is helpful. If it's helpful, otherwise, you know, um, you know, just move on from this. I mean, this is a general rule, but uh, may not be accurate for the track that you practice on. Um, if this is just a general um, picture of where the start lines are, um, just for uh, orientation, the stands are up in this area. This is the, the start or the finish line for. Um, the general finish line for most all events. So your stands are up here. This is the far side of the track, which also has stands, but these stands are generally empty. Uh, your red stars <clears throat> indicate where um, the typical location of a starter is for the different um, uh, different distances. Um, um, he will make accommodations to make sure you know to ensure that. The athletes can um, can see him. He can see all the athletes on the start line. But typically, this is where 
um, our starter um, will locate himself um, for each of the races. All races will start with a gun, no exception. Um, so please train your athletes um, to start with a gun. Um, you know, the accommodation that, that, that can be made for extreme cases of the starter can reposition himself um, at his um, sole discretion, but he will still use a gun. This, um, you know, is occasionally something that, that's asked, but um, the rule is he will reposition himself for, you know, um, you know if he feels it, it, it's, it's necessary, but we will, um, there's no leeway on this. We will start every race with a gun. Uh, athletes must be able to um, start the race by himself or herself. Um, Less bullet, um, uh, your athletes who have hearing impairments should watch for the smoke of the gun. Um, they can also get a supplemental tap start or, or flag start at the starter's discretion. Our races up to and including the 400 meters, the three command start on your marks, set, and the gun. For races longer than 400 meters, um, he will use a two command start on your marks and then the gun. For um, events up to and including the 400, um, your athletes may use starting blocks. <clears throat> and if need be, um, you can use a volunteer to anchor the block. False starts are charged to the individual, not to the field. Two false starts by the same runner results in a DQ. Um, most of these are self-explanatory. Your athlete must be able to race by him or herself. Um, for athletes with um, visually impaired, um, we have in the past, and I'm not sure um, we will certainly offer again the use of a guide rope or a human guide provided by us if your athlete is unable to use a guide rope. Um, in races um, that are running lanes, um, even those running lanes including the curve, the athletes must stay in lanes. Um, if uh, those races that do involve a curve, like 400, cutting into an inside lane, that's a DQ. You're shortening the, the distance of the race. In races strictly on a straight part of the track, it's not necessarily a DQ for leading a lane unless that athlete impedes um, another athlete or leaves the track. Four hundred meter race will go stagger start and must be run entirely in lanes. Eight hundred stagger start stays in lane around the first turn, then can cut in. Longer than eight hundred will use a waterfall start and can immediately cut in. We always have a question, hardly ever by coaches, but oftentimes by family members and, and, and spectators um, about the finish. The place is determined by the order the racers cross the finish line, not necessarily the recorded times. I and mean, we have um, we have eight folks out there with stopwatches, you know, they're they're all at least trained on the day of or starting on time and clicking when they finish, but we also have someone uh, capturing the order of finish. Um, so your, your athletes will be awarded their place by the order of finish. Sometimes um, you know, stopwatch malfunction, stopwatch was not started on time. Oftentimes we will have multiple uh, watches on, on for most of the athletes. We, we do if we can. Uh, just like in um, our throwing events or our distance events, recorders are uh, re times are recorded to the next highest uh, time um, because that athlete has not reached. Um, if it's 3.22, they have not reached 3.2, so it's, it's rounded up to 3.3. And again, the finish line is based on the torso reaching the finish line, not the head, not the arms, not the feet. Um, and for richer athletes is for the front wheels of the wheelchair. Um, for relays, four by one, we use a stagger start, stay in, re stay in lanes throughout. 
four by two stagger start and we've been doing this i think pretty much since we implemented implemented four by two we will stay in lanes throughout the four by two as well well hopefully stay in lanes throughout the four by two um four by four again we mentioned this earlier um whether we you know how we do a stagger is dependent on the number of teams um in that division Like we, um, uh, and I apologize if I missed something uh, in the next couple of slides about relays where I misnamed the um, exchange zone. Hopefully, I pulled out everything that said fly zone. Um, but these are uh, the rules for, for the baton, no difference. Uh, the exchange must be entirely within the exchange zone. If it's dropped during the exchange, the incoming runner must pick it and complete the exchange. Um, the incoming runner cannot drop it and have the next runner pick it up and have that be a, a legal exchange. Alternates, um, you can list your alternates for your relays. Um, they must be someone who's entered as a regular athlete in the overall event. They may be assigned to specific teams, maximum two per team, or they may, may be unassigned. And you know, and will be assigned, you know, for whatever reason you need to utilize an alternate. Um, this slide is sort of a, a leftover from when we first implemented the four by two. Um, if your athlete is running the four by two, that's on the first day on Saturday, they may also enter either the four by one or the four by four on Sunday. I'm not sure what which of our programs um, does not have access to a track um, to practice on. Um, obviously, a track is always preferred when available. Um, if you don't have access or you have to run a practice um, uh, on something other than a track, here's a couple of suggestions. Um, practice your use of a gun. I mean, you're, you're doing your athletes a disservice if in your practices and in your qualifiers, uh, well, certainly your qualifiers, you need to use a gun. But um, your athletes should be practicing their starts with the use of a gun. Again, if you don't have access to um, you know, to an inside like the field of a, of a track, you know, find your your spot where you can mark some vectors um, and get the the correct vector size, either two by three or four by eight. Um, if you, you know, for shot put, if you uh, can't get a toe board, just mark a circle, something that, that can simulate for your athlete what it will look like at the qualifiers and at state games. And a point that we probably don't emphasize enough for the shot put, just, you know, in your coaching, um, it's a push, it's not a throw. You can really um, uh, injure one's shoulder, one's arm, one's elbow. It, uh, if any of your athletes are trying to throw a, sh a shot, a shot like they're throwing a softball, it's different. Again, some more suggestions when you don't have a track. Um, so, you know, as far as your jumping events, we will use the jumping bits, whether it's the standing long jump or the long jump. Um, so it's again to your athletes benefit and um, that they practice using a jump pit. Okay. Uh, oh, Ron, sorry. just one, uh -huh. before you, Ron, before you go on, just one clarification uh, on this. Please note that at the top of the slide, uh, it says training suggestions. These are all suggestions on these slides for use in your training program if uh, uh, you don't have access to a track for that training time. Uh, and as Ron indicated, of course, it, the um, the situation you should really strive for is to have a track. These are not, these are not acceptable alternatives for a competition, for a qualifier, for time trials, for anything. Um, those should always and only be done at an appropriate uh track and field uh, track competition uh, space. This is strictly for training. Thanks, Ron. Yep.
Alex. <clears throat> Qualifiers, um, um, we emphasize very strongly, follow the rules. Again, um, you are not doing your athletes a service by doing anything different than, than the, the rules that we will be following at, um, at summer games. Um, so uh, again, you know, conduct your events as actual divisions. So um, no assistance, no running with your athletes in, in the running events. Um, so you know, we want to make sure that the competition experience from a qualifier translates straight to um, summer games. Currently, um, and, and I just checked this this morning, so um, these are the qualifiers that um, we have on our schedule at the present time. Um, please send to me, send to your um, regional sports director. Um, if you're able to host another qualifier, um, um, but as of um, as of 3:14, maybe noontime or a little bit earlier today, these are the, the qualifiers that we have on our schedule. So we are actively looking for additional qualifiers. If you you have something and you have a date, uh, please let us know. Um, and actually, I'll put in a pitch for a model that. Um that we've been promoting, uh, many of you know, I, I, this is, again, this is Mike. Um, uh, I still coach with Baltimore County. Uh, we've used a model um, uh, called an all, an all comers meet, uh, which is stripped down. It's strictly competition. Uh, you don't uh, have all the peripheral stuff with ceremonies and awards and uh, all the fanfare. It's you come and you compete. Uh, I'd be more than happy uh, to connect with, with you if you're interested in doing something like that. If you have a track and you have the time, uh, and it's also utilizing the coaches and the volunteers from all the programs that are participating to run the actual meet. Uh, everybody comes together for a great day. Um, Baltimore County in recent years has not been able to host many of those due to the uh, some restrictions at the facility that we utilize uh, ha have, has had to unfortunately uh, implement. But um, uh, hopefully we'll we'll get some change to that in the future. But I'd be more than happy to talk you through how to do that. Great, yeah. Those are, I mean, I've been to a couple of those in Baltimore County uh, in the past, and um, you know, those are really good experiences for the athletes as well. You know, they get to run all the same events uh, or throw in all the same events that that they will in summer games. And um, so, thank you, Mike. Okay, a couple of standard slides about our resources, my SOMD. Um, you see the, the calendars and various materials. Um, if you don't have a log on, a login for my SOMD, let me know and we'll get you access. Um, always feel free to go out to specialolympics.org for Special Olympics rules, coaching guides, planning training sessions. Um, many of these guides, many of these materials have embedded videos and there are also other videos that um, can help you through your your coaching and uh, training experience. A um, couple of websites, and you'll you'll have these slides tomorrow. Um, these will be live links to help you if you need to order equipment. So you can um, check some of those out um, if you need to order um, tomorrow when you get the, this slide deck. Okay, um, at this point of the program, um, you know. There's some important rules, regulations, reg registration forms and procedures that we are emphasizing as strongly as we can. Um, and I know Mike um, is going to uh, take over for a little bit to talk about uh, the upcoming slides uh, and the requirements that we are going to adhere to this year. So uh, Mike, do you want me to page through this, this slide or uh, these slides or? Uh, sure, actually just go to this next one. This is. Yeah, I mean everything that I that I need to say can be here, and then you can go with the uh, covering the deadlines and such. Um, okay. So, folks, th this we we've had the same slide uh, repeatedly. This should not be a surprise to anybody. This has not changed. Really, nothing has changed. Um, but just to to make it clear, no athlete can participate without a valid medical, and no volunteer can participate without a valid volunteer application. There are absolutely no exceptions, 
And there is absolutely no excuse for allowing that to happen. Um, we've, we've noticed uh, that there, uh, I don't know whether it's confusion or uh, people are reluctant to enforce this, but it's, uh, there, there have been some things that have happened recently that make us question as to whether or not um, actually the, the athletes' medicals and the volunteer applications are in hand. I'll talk about that in just a second, but um, but again, there is no, there, there can be no wiggle room on this. Um, again, I mentioned before that I still coach, I've been coaching now for, uh, this will be my 38th, 39th year uh, coaching uh, track for Special Olympics. And every year there's typically one or two athletes uh, who show and their medical is expired. Um, uh, Joyce Powell, who is our track and field coordinator, does you know an excellent job working in advance to make sure that they get it. But if their medical is not there, we have to tell them to sit down uh, and 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 observe, or they they need to go home and wait until they get their medical. Uh, you cannot make any exception. You cannot make an exception of they're you know they're just going to do some light running or whatever, it doesn't matter. They cannot participate without that valid medical. Um, you are opening yourself up to personal liability and you're opening Special Olympics up to significant um, liability to the organization overall. Um, if God forbid, uh, you know, some injury happens um, and you can injure just doing, get injured just doing light running. Um, uh, and such. We had an athlete, uh, for example, who was not running very fast at a, a practice, and he had his medical, so I'm not uh, whatever, but uh, he basically tripped over his own feet and fell, did a face plant on the track, fell flat on his face, and um, had to go to the hospital um, because of that. That can happen with light running as well. Um, again, uh, he, he absolutely had his medical, and we happened to have two nurses there, so that uh, helped with that. But um, mm -hmm. it can't, it, this can, just cannot be allowed. One thing that may have contributed to some confusion on this is uh, with the next slide that Ron will go through, there is a thing that we call the last day for outstanding forms or for missing forms. That is not a date that is, that's not the date by which the athlete has to get the medical to you. That is strictly an administrative deadline where um, we may not have the medical for that athlete or the volunteer application for that coach, unified partner, volunteer, whatever. We may not have that at headquarters. That's the date by which when we tell the leaders in the area, hey, we're missing this form. Can you get it to us? That they get it to us. But that uh, they need that's under the understanding that they have that form in hand, that they're not still trying to track that down. If they don't have that form in hand, that athlete's not participating uh, or that volunteer is not participating. And again, there are absolutely no exceptions. With that in mind, uh, we will be adhering to that date absolutely firmly um, with, with no wiggle room on that. Um, uh, there, well, there's, there's one situation, I'm not going to go into it, where a volunteer can't legally sign. Uh, until a later date. And we'll deal with those as, as individual cases. But um, we're going to be sticking to that. We're telling you now ahead of time, um, as I'm sure Ron will echo, talk to the, your folks in your areas, uh, in your area leadership who handle your medicals. They can tell you who they have their forms for and who they don't have the forms for. We're implementing some stuff at headquarters to push rosters out on a more, on a more regular basis, as well as train area leaders, again, how to, um, uh, how to uh, run reports on their own so they can see it regularly. Um, but uh, I, I just can't, I'm sorry to keep going overboard, but this is a huge issue that we, we just cannot allow to happen. If you learn nothing else, or if you walk away from the session today, tonight, with nothing else, walk away knowing that this that no athlete can ever participate without a valid medical no matter how much it tugs at your heartstrings and no volunteer can ever participate without a valid volunteer application so uh, i'll get off my soapbox um but it's an important soapbox and uh ron back to you 
Okay, <clears throat> thanks, Mike. Um, and what I've had up for the last couple of minutes is the registration dates and deadlines. Um, Mike talked about um, the, um, you know, in the second shaded area about uh, last date for missing forms. Um, as far as a competition, I just want to talk about the last um, couple of lines on the competition registration deadline, 524. Um, uh, team rosters events must be entered in the GMS by 524. We are giving um, teams and areas up through because of, of late qualifiers that you need to update scores, update times, update distances. Um, you have until 529 to, um, to update that in GMS. After that time, everything's locked down. We, we're starting our, our divisioning process and all our paperwork. So um, just keep note of, of those dates. Um, uh, like Mike emphasized, you know, work with your area leadership, you know, to make sure that our athletes, you know, by partners, coaches, volunteers, all have their proper form. So I'm not going to, um, I mean, I, I can't have to emphasize this too much, but I'm not going to belabor it tonight because we do want to release everybody in a timely manner this evening. Um, again, coaches requirements, they must have class A volunteer application and associated background screening, um, uh, completion and submission of protective behavior screening, completion and submission of online concussion training. We have uh, hyperlinks for that um, in a couple slides. So if you have any questions about where it is that um, your coaches and your volunteers need to go to, to find these things, um, you can get it from here. Um, if need be, we can send those forms out to you. Again, I think everybody, I'm not sure if we have anybody new on the line tonight, all of these forms, uh, once they're filled out, completed, and accepted, are valid for three years. Okay, um, we say uh, this was started um, coming up on two years ago. All coaches must have completed concussion training prior to starting uh, coach, uh, coaching. Not just head coaches, this is all coaches, all your uh, assistant coaches. So it's quite possible for this and for other of the um, of the registrations that some coaches, if they had, had um, taken a concussion prior to 2016, um, some of those may be coming up for renewal, um, may be um, expiring um, sometimes before summer games. So we um, uh, we need to keep track of that because um, they need may need to be updated. Um, here are your um, links to a couple different concussion training um, uh, online courses. Um, either one of these is um, acceptable by Special Olympics. Protective behaviors, again, required not just by Special Olympics Maryland, but by Special Olympics International and Special Olympics North America. All volunteers, coaches, unified partners, sports volunteers must have an up-to-date protective behavior certification prior to starting their volunteer role. <clears throat> Here um, uh, is the link to the online course. Uh, once completely complete, um, uh, once the course is complete, and here is um, a slide that I did not update. Um, the volunteer email notifications. Rachel, who is still helping us on, on a part-time basis. Um, uh, she is no longer you know, an act, uh, a full-time employee at Special Olympics Maryland. Um, but I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, when you take the protective behaviors course online um, and submit the, um, your exam or the quiz at the end, those uh, notifications come directly to Special Olympics. So there's no additional um, uh, notifications for protective behavior. But volunteer uh, emails, yeah, there should be there should not be an issue in terms of that, but um, you know sometimes technology breaks down. Uh, if you have it and you want to go ahead and send it in, you can just send it to coaches at somd.org. Um, uh, that shifts it to a, an email address that won't change as any staff members change. But uh, we'll update right. that and include that in the email that goes out with the uh, links and all. Yep. 
and I will do that uh, before I send it out tomorrow. <clears throat> okay. Um, qualifying for the state, um, all uh, athletes, um, coaches, partners, um, meet all the training and registration requirements and deadlines, certification requirements, um, athletics, uh, your athletes must compete in a minimum of two sanctioned qualifiers, um, and those are described, one of which can be at like um, uh, a, um, or one must be a multi-area qualifier, and that can be your all-comers meet that Mike described earlier. Okay, I think we're coming up towards um, towards the end. If you have any questions, here's the, the names and um, email addresses um, for the regional sports directors and their um, uh, areas that they represent. Um, Again, this is um, you know, a, a restating of the same slide that that, um, that Mike talked about earlier for uh, valid and current athlete uh, uh, application for, for participation, the athlete medical. As we go through this, and you'll see tomorrow, we have the actual, um, uh, at least on the slide, um, we have the forms. These haven't changed since 2016, I, I believe, the uh, athlete medical. Correct. Um, it's uh, five part. Um, the, this page, page four, only needs to be completed if a referral is needed. Um, if you have, um, uh, uh, anyway, you've all, if you're not familiar with the form, you should be. But anyway, the, um, the forms are included in the slide deck along with. Um, the slide after this is the volunteer app form um, where all volunteers, including coaches, including the partners, must submit a, a um, volunteer app, which will initiate a background check um, and um, needs to be in before you start your training. If um, your volunteer is a minor, um, he or she must also complete the volunteer minor reference form, which we also have a slide. You can see what that is as well. Here's the volunteer app, page two. Make sure um, this will get sent back if it's not signed and dated. Student minor reference form. Um, again, for your meets, um, we should have any qualifying meets. I, I, um, you, you should be having it every practice too. Um, the form following this, the first report of accident or incident report. Um, there you go for that. Fill that out um, and return all sections to um, uh, your area director, whether it's um, uh, your area director in your, in your program. Um, who can send it into Special Olympics where we can get it into Rhonda in, as a director of operations. Coach sports certification, uh, as we wrap this up, um, all our coaches uh, must have sports certification valid through the summer games by 5-5-2018. Again, these uh, certifications are valid for three years. We will send out a report uh, by the end of this month of the status of all your coaches from last year and any coaches that have been, uh, you've notified us new coaches for this year. Um, we'll also provide learning opportunities. Hopefully we can, um, I've gotten a little bit of a late start and see if we can get an in-person um, session, but there is, um, uh, there are online courses available. Yeah, if folks are interested in hosting uh, a training course for that, uh, for uh, specific to track and field, uh, yeah, reach out to Ron. Um, we we have enough folks who could certainly deliver that that we can make something happen with adequate notice. We're not going to you can't tell us today and have us do something on Saturday, um, but uh, you know give us at least a few weeks' notice and uh, we can make something work out. Um, similar slides we've had in the past. This is for all. Um, these are the court uh, course titles through ASAP, which. Um, um, are available um, 
and, and the subsidy for the that that um, Special Olympics Maryland will um, will cover. Um, you can read this on your own. These are the um, what's an approved course of development experience. Some generalized um, coaching uh, courses, coaching Special Olympics athletes, which I recommend for for everyone. Principles of coaching. Um, first aid, any of these uh, other courses. Um, and anything else you can think of, um, give us a call, um, send us an email. If you have an idea, we will certainly look at it. We're um, certainly open to your ideas. That was um, obviously the last slide. And uh, I'm looking at the control panel. Um, I see a question mark next, next to Vicki's name. Uh, Vicki, um, do you have a question? Uh, that was actually Vicki letting us know earlier that she could see the slides advance but not hear us. Uh, we did have okay. uh, uh, David Lang from Montgomery County noted that uh, Montgomery County is hosting their spring games on May 20th. Um, I know that they typically have a limited number of uh, opportunities for folks from other counties to join them. Uh, so uh, they'll be in the, we send out a uh, an updated sports calendar to area leaders every two weeks um and uh we'll and when ron sends stuff out as well we'll have that contact information for you um again uh it's there they do fill up so um uh, but thank you david for letting us know uh, and okay. i don't see anybody else's hand up or any other questions let's give folks a moment or two <clears throat> I would guess that's it, Ron. Okay, thank you, everybody. And again, um, we will have these. Uh, you know, this webinar is being recorded. We'll have the. Um, we'll get it up on YouTube. Send you all a link to that for the folks in the programs who were not able to join us this evening. And we'll get the slide deck out to you as well. So thank you very much. We ran right up to eight o'clock, probably because I started the webinar without anybody being able to see it for a good five minutes. Uh, so thank you so much. Looking forward to a great season. Yeah, thank you, everyone. We look forward to seeing you out there. Thank you for all the work you're going to do with your athletes, getting them ready for the competitions. Thank you. Thanks.